So hepatitis B virus infection, just in general, um, may be acute and self-limiting if you are infected as an adult. However, if you're infected as a uh, young child, then very often it becomes chronic. Um, and that's where the vast majority of chronic carriers come from, and that's a lot. It's about 4% of the, of the world population, so 260 million carriers, causing 880,000 deaths a year. And many of you might not know what the WHO published in 2017, that basically all the major infectious diseases, the death rates go down for HIV, malaria, and even tuberculosis, while they are still on the rise for, for viral hepatitis, bringing it up to the number two and almost to the level of death caused by tuberculosis. So WHO said, okay, there is an urgent need to do something and to diagnose, to prevent, but also to find curative therapies. And the problem with um, chronic hepatitis B is that it causes, uh, first of all, mild symptoms, but after a while, these this, it goes up to liver cirrhosis, which you can see here. And on the basis of liver cirrhosis, but even without, a lot of patients develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And that's what then causes the high death rates. So how can we treat or prevent that? What is available is nucleic acid, uh, nucleoside analogs. They come from HIV. Basically, that's RT, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Um, and we have interferons. However, in HPV, the nucleoside analogs, they act at a very late step of the life cycle. So only here, when the virus leaves the cell, not early. That means they are not curative, and you have to treat long term with all the problems. There is novel things under development, because there's quite a bit of interest now, also by the pharmaceutical industry. And these is, is for example, capsid assembly inhibitors, also going to a similar step in the life cycle. There is as iRNAs, which target the RNA. There is something which targets the, the release of antigens. And there is entry blockers under development. They are all not released. They are going into one phase one, two trials. However, none of them really targets the persistence form of HPV, which we call CCC DNA in the nucleus. That's this form. It's like a little plasmid in the nucleus of infected cells, not integrated like in, H in HIV. Um, so how can you target this? Basically, you could think of killing infected cells. You could hope that it's lost over time by cell division, or you could try to directly degrade it in the nucleus. And all of these would be done by an immune response, because the immune response would kill infected cells, then the cells would divide, and CCC DNA would get lost. And I'll show you in a minute also uh, degrade CCC DNA. Now, which options for inducing an immune response do you have? Basically, you can think of immune stimulatory molecules like cytokines, pattern recognition agonists, or checkpoint inhibitors. All these would be non-specific. Oops, sorry. Um, so they would be not specific for HPV, but they would just in general activate some sort of immune response and cause side effects. And so far, they have not been successful in the clinics. So a little more promising may be the antigen-specific ideas. And antigen-specific would be either an antibody-mediated therapy, a T-cell redirection, or a therapeutic vaccine, which will all be directed really against the virus. Let's start to talk about a therapeutic vaccine. What we know is that T-cell responses are very important in, in the control of HPV. Um, there is, in rare cases, about 0.2% per year, a spontaneous cure of HPV. And this is always accompanied by T cell, increasing T cell responses. So while there is very little during chronic infection, there is responses when the infection is cleared. And doctors have done an experiment for us because they have done um, bone marrow transplantation from a patient with natural immunity into a chronic carrier. And this cured the infection meaning that the T cells can, are important in cure. So how, wh what do they do? Basically, that's the virus, what you see here. So these roundish particles, and then you always have the long particles and the subviral particles. Um, this is empty envelopes. That's basically, um, well, they, they distract the immune response. Now, when the immune response is strong, 
and you have T cell responses but also antibody responses, then there is a limiting infection, a self-limiting infection. Whereas if you have almost no T cells um, and there is no, no neutralizing antibodies, then you have a chronic infection. And that's really a difference to other viral diseases where you readily can detect T cell responses like EBV, CMV, HIV. In HPV, you hardly detect anything. Whether you look into the liver or into the periphery, there is almost nothing. Now a therapeutic vaccine would have the idea to turn this around. So basically to bring, this is a really hard to use thing, <laughs> to bring the, the scarce T cell and lacking antibody response into a strong immune response. Now how do we think one could do that? We, we tried around for about 10 years um, to find the, the optimal scheme. And basically what we would do is we would start with patients which are on antiviral treatment to have a situation where the virus infects as few cells as possible, but, and, and also there is little inflammation. And what we then do is we, pro, we vaccinate with proteins. And for this we use two particular proteins to on the one hand induce a neutralizing antibody response because we think that's very important. Bec uh, so to prevent that the virus further spreads throughout the bodies and then T cells have to just run behind the virus. So the first thing we want to do is induce a neutralizing anti response and at the same time we want to prime the, c the T cells and induce CD4 T cell helper cell responses. Once we have that achieved, yeah, then we come with a viral vector and the viral vector is thought to expand the T cell responses and really arm the CD8 T cells to induce a, an effector um, response. And as a vector, we decided to use an MVA vector because it's a very safe and very effective boosting vector. That's admittedly quite a complicated scheme because you need three different, four different components. You need two proteins and one vector plus an adjuvant. So it's not very easy to uh, develop that, but it works. And this is shown in this example. What we did here is that we transduced mice with HPV using an AAV vector. So basically the AAV is only the vehicle because you cannot inf directly infect mice with HPV. And what those mice do is they develop a very nice and persistent HPV infection over, you can follow that up to a year. Now when we vaccinate those animals, um, then they lose the AS antigen, they develop anti-AS responses, so neutralizing antibody responses, and, uh, and that would already be what in the clinics one would call a functional cure of HPV. So basically loss of AS and anti-AS, zero conversion. However, the, the mice also develop T cell responses, and these in our experience are finally then um, essential to really keep the virus in check. And these T cells you can detect in the liver um, and they are core specific or S specific, whatever you put into your, into your viral vector. One thing which limits the effectivity of a therapeutic vaccine is the antigen dose. So when we, when we uh, transduce animals with different doses um, of the AAV, then we can either have rather low uh, viremic and replication mice, medium ones and high ones. And if we vaccinate the low ones, they all clear. The medium ones respond, but do not completely clear. And the high viremic ones, they do hardly respond to our vaccine. And that's of course then a problem because that would mean you can only use patients with a limited antigen expression. And that's also reflected when you look at this in the, in the immune response. So all of the animals which we vaccinated develop an anti-S response at very nice titers. So 10 up to the, um, 10 up to the second, so 100 mm -hmm. would already be a completely um, protected situation. So all the mice have a neutralizing antibody response, but not all of the mice develop a T cell response. When you look into T cell responses, then the mice with a high antigen titer have hardly any detectable T cells whereas those with a low pre-existing titer, they nicely respond and that's why they then finally clear. So the antigen level which pre-exists determines the efficacy of a therapeutic vaccination. What can you do about this? 
basically one thing you could do is you could try to lower the antigen load using an siRNA, and that's what we did. And when we gave an siRNA, siRNA um, and this is a galma coupled siRNA, which is basically readily transported to the liver and is rather stable. You only have to give that once every four weeks. Uh, and when we do so, then the animals drop in their antigen titers. And when the, however, if you do not vaccinate, then once the effect of the siRNA is gone, they come back up to the original level which they had. But when you then, after lowering the antigen load, start to vaccinate, then all of the mice we had, and this is more than, uh, than 20 in those experiments, they completely cleared the infection. They developed antibody responses, they developed T cell responses, and most importantly, looking into the liver, what you see is that if you give an siRNA only after, in this case, 24 weeks, the viral infection looks like the control one. But if you then vaccinate after the siRNA, there is no HPV positive cells detectable anymore. The HPV signal in this case is this brownish nuclei, which, which you see here. And this is completely gone, meaning that the therapeutic vaccine really was able to clear the infection. An alternative way um, of bringing more or really effective T cells or prevent the exhaustion of T cells um, would be T cell redirection. And that's the next step I'd like to discuss with you. Um, so basically, you all know that you can retarget T cells by grafting them with either T cell receptors, which would consist out of an alpha and a beta chain, or with a chimeric antigen receptor, which is sort of an artificial construct directed by a antibody, uh, in this case a single um, chain antibody fragment recognizing the antigen on the surface of an infected cell. And the T cell receptor, in contrast, recognizes an MHC presented peptide. And as a last alternative, what you can theoretically use is um, bispecific bi antibodies, meaning antibodies that would bind the, a protein on the infected cell and then attract via binding to CD3 or CD28 the T cells. So first of all, when you do that, you have to decide which antigen to go for. And we decided to go for the AS antigen because the AS antigen is continuously produced from the CCC DNA, DNA as long as it's there. And even when the virus um, would integrate, they mostly still produce AS antigen. So that seems to be a very good target. And this is not only presented by MHC molecules, but it's also detected on the surface of infected cells, as you can see in the upper panel at the, in an immune histochemistry, and at the lower panel at an EM staining we did um, on infected cells, where these little dots um, are coupled, or are gold particles coupled to an anti-S antibody, and they bind to the surface of infected cells. Now, what would you do? Um, you would have a patient which is infected with HPV, and this is a chronic patient, so that would have a very weak T cell response, really scars, almost undetectable T cells, and part of them would be dysfunctional. And we would like to get into a stage of an acute hepatitis B where you have enough T cells and they are functional. So we would isolate the T cells out of the patient. We would graft them with T cell receptors, by a genetic modification, we would expand and then reinfuse the T cells. That's basically the idea. Um, so the goal is to restore the T cell immunity through transfer of genetically modified T cells. And we did that, uh, first of all, using a chimeric antigen receptor. So what we did is we developed a CAR, which um, has as a binder a single chain recognizing the S protein on the surface of infected cells. And the advantage of such a CAR over a T cell receptor would be that it's independent of the patient MHC type. There is no T cell receptor mispairing. It's independent of antigen pro uh, processing. However, so as there is virus and antigen in the circulation, this CAR may be inactivated. 
So Felix Bohne in the lab did set out and generated such a car. And what he did is he got patient liver um, based liver from metastasis resection and prepared primary hepatocytes. And these pre primary hepatocytes he could infect with HPV or left uninfected. And then from the very same um, donor where he got the hepatocytes from, he also got PBMC and grafted the PBMC with his car. And what he found is that if he uses uh, the right binder, in this case the anti-S binder, then the T cells become activated, they secrete interferon gamma and IL-2, and um, most importantly, they clear all the CCC DNA in the culture. So basically they did cure the, f the, the cell cultures. And um, to see whether this was also something you could do in vivo, um, we went into HPV transgenic mice. And also in the HPV transgenic mice, we found that the, the CAR T cells, um, they, ah, that's what I wanted. Fine. They reduced the antigen load continuously, so they were neither inactivated nor overactivated by the circulating protein. So that looked ni ni quite nice. Um, and then we, s we asked ourselves, okay, would now the car grafted T cells have to kill really every single infected cell, or could they maybe have effects via cytokines, so non cytolytic effects as well? And the answer is yes, they could. And what we found is, um, a mechanism by which cytokines affect the CCC DNA of the virus because they induce um, apobec type deaminases which then go to the CCC DNA molecule. They change it, they modify it by deaminating and then it becomes um, a, 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 a target of degradation by deaminases. And that works also when you use car grafted T cells and this was shown by um, Eugene Xia in the lab in an experiment where he basically either used the T cell cytokines, interferon gamma and TNF to treat infected cells or he co-cultured the cells with, with um, the car grafted T cells. And then instead of co-culturing he separated by a transvel the T cells from the infected cell. And on that transvel he could either activate the, the car grafted cells or left them unactivated. And that means that um, in this case here you would have a non-cytolytic effect because there is no T cell. Here you have direct killing which can occur, so that would be a cytolytic effect. And in this case again you would have a non-cytolytic effect because the T cells are separated from the infected cells and can only secrete mediators. And what came out of this experiment is the following. So when you, this would be CCC DNA and also antigen production by cells which are infected and mock treated. This is when you have the car grafted cells in your transvol but not stimulated, so the very same. When you now stimulate your car grafted cell but they have no contact, then you find a reduction of the S antigen, the CCC DNA, and it's almost to the same extent as when you co-culture. And also when you just give the cytokines that happens. So basically what happens here is that you have a cytolytic effect of the T cells as expected, but you also have a non-cytolytic effect which um, contributes to the elimination of, of HPV. And we think that that's is a very promising approach and also points to the fact that you really should activate T cell responses. As an alternative to car grafting, you could theoretically use um, T cell receptors and that has been reported in the literature and the last few slides I'd like to discuss with you how this would like in a, in a therapeutic setting. So basically we would use T cell receptors consisting out of an alpha and a beta chain that recognizes an MHC um, presented peptide here. Karin Wiskirchen in the lab used the uh, either acute resolving or even resolved donors and stimulated their PBMC and isolated T cells by streptomer sorting and then uh, cloned the T cell receptor out of those successful memory T cells and used them uh, to graft T cells of healthy donors and what you can see here is one of those T cell receptors on the surface of, of the donor cells on CD4 as well as CD8 positive cells. 
And she cloned a whole series of T-cell receptors and scored them by, by having the best ones um, that is published. So what we now did is we asked the question, what if we use our best T-cell receptors, which in this case recognize the AS antigen, which we've already discussed, but also the core antigen in cell culture, and more importantly, in humanized mouse models, which can be infected. And um, what, for this we teamed up with Maura Dendry in Hamburg, and Maura has a model of humanized mice, it's UPA skid mice, uh, or skid beige mice, which have an IL-2 receptor gamma knockout and are immunodeficient, and she can graft them with human hepatocytes. And in our case, she had to use HLA-A2 positive hepatocytes, because that's the HLA molecule our T cell receptors recognize. Then she can infect the mice, and the mice develop a chronic infection, and we could produce T cells and um, give them into the mice, and then ask what happens. And what happened is, um, that the mice basically, or the T cells, they cleared all the HPV infected cells in those mice. And you can nicely see that here in the immunofluorescent staining of the liver. Everything you see in green is HPV. So in, in this case here, that's the HPV core protein, and that's mock treated mice, and that's the HPV core protein in mice which received our T cell receptor grafted T cells and that's HPV RNA, and again, the mice which were treated. Now you can say, okay, maybe the mice lost all their T cells. That's not the case, because that's the human um, beta-2 microglobulin, and that's the human CK18, so there is still human hepatocytes left, but there is no HPV left anymore. However, there is a reduction, so there is a cytolytic activity of the T cells, as well as a non-cytolytic a little bit as we have dis um, predicted from our experiments before. Now we ask the question, okay, um, if there is cells left with the mice, would the infection reoccur, would there be a, a relapse? And we just waited longer. So in a second experiment, we did not kill the mice after three weeks, but we waited for two months. Um, and what we found here is that depending on the titer which the mice originally had, we had an initial ALT peak. This could be quite severe if there were a lot of cells infected, and it was moderate if there was a moderate amount of cells infected, rather what you would find in a chronic in, uh, carrier. However, this ALT peak was very transient, and all the mice at day 14 had normal ALT levels again. So the liver damage or the cytotoxic effect was really limited to a rather short time point. And uh, what about the antiviral effect uh, effectivity? Um, whether the mice started as high viremic carriers or as low viremic carriers, they all lost their E antigen and almost all of them also lost their AS antigen, whereas the control mice had constant levels. And looking into the, into the liver, we found that the mice treated with our T cell, our grafted T cells had no detectable CCC DNA anymore whereas you can readily detect it in the mice which um, have not been treated. So apparently this effect or this, this approach can be curative and um, it works in high titer as well as in low titer mice because the T cells become activated and just expand. So in summary, what, we, what I've shown you is that T cells can be retargeted using either T cell receptors or CARs against the, the different HPV antigens. The redirected cells, T cells kill HPV in infected cells. They also kill hepatoma cells, which I didn't show you right now, but you have to believe me. The antiviral effect is both cytolytic and non-cytolytic. Um, as T cell therapy is a little tedious, it might be more useful for HPV-related hepatocellular carcinoma than for the infectious disease per se, especially if you think of going into, uh, into regions where, it's, uh, where there's not such a lot of money as in the US or in Europe. So T cell is, um, engage your antibodies might be an interesting alternative, also maybe uh, delivered via DNA modes, and also therapeutic vaccination, I think, would be something very interesting because it would be more broadly applicable. And with that, I'm at the end, I'd like to thank those people who did all the work, 
Um, the major contributors are marked in red here, and our, our collaborators in Hamburg and um, in, in Munich, and also from El Nylum for the SIRNA. And I thank you for your attention. The paper is now open for questions. So, <laughs> yes, nice. um, the CARD and the TCR T cells obviously have, have the same mode of action. So, uh, have you done a head-to-head -head comparison, and, and or, or is, is it uh, or are there theoretical uh, consideration that would say, okay, this one is better than that one? Yeah, we we have done head-to-head -head, um, comparison, although it's a yeah. little hard to do um, because obviously the the mode of activation of the T cells is very different. What we've done is we've titrated down um, the MOI when we infect cells to just determine the antigen load which we need. And it looks as if uh, the activation of our car needs a, an antigen load which is three times as high as the T cell receptor needs. It's something which you would expect, but that's, that's how far uh, we can go. Could get. Uh, check. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I saw that you did this uh, CAR T cell. Have you tried some of the CAR modified NK cell for the HPV infection? Mm -hmm. Yes, we've tried that. Um, however, we are not specialists in handling NK cells. Um, our problem always was that in the in vitro models, there is there was a lot of background activity by the NK cells, much more than we had with the with the T cells. And um, as working in the humanized mice is very tedious and you're very restricted, we did not do that in vivo yet. Thank you. So uh, in the uh, humanized mice, there was a significant loss of human hepatocytes. How much, uh, and also the ALTs were quite impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think, is that a safety issue coming to humans, you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the mice where we, you might have noticed that the mice which had the high ALT and with, which had the high cell loss, they really had like 80-90% of the hepatocytes infected. Um, you would not go into a human which has that high number of infected cells. And the mice which had more like 10-20% to 20 of hepatocytes infected, there the ALT went up to 100-150, which would be tolerated in the clinics. So I think um, before we, we would treat a patient, we would really do a biopsy and look for the number of infected cells to estimate the risk. But it's a concern, no question. Hi. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, just wondering about your persistence of the T cell, the gene-modified T cell within the body. So would you expect any T cell exhaustion? I didn't get that, sorry. Uh, would you expect any T cell exhaust, exhaustion? No, no, I get it. Yeah. Um, we, we checked the T cells, and when we, when we analyzed the T cells after T cell transfer, about 50% of them are, or almost all of them, are PD-1 positive. But that's always when you look into the liver, they have 80-90% of PD-1 positive cells. But about half of them still produce cytokines, and half of them don't. So I would say that half of them are exhausted, half of them are not. Okay, thank you very much.